privilege to have with us a woman who was very involved in the Chabad community, one who was very active on campus in Binghamton University, one who wrote a few books, one who travels the world, gives lectures, and one who happens to be my son's mother-in-law. But in any case, a woman that's very well respected, very well liked, very well educated, and without further ado, I would like to introduce to all of you Rivka Slavin. Chinese, I don't speak any of the dialects, uh, you know, prevalent in that part of the world, and I really don't know if it's going to be worth your time. And they said, not to worry, we have a very skilled interpreter, he'll take care of things, and so armed and bolstered with that piece of information, and excited to go see that part of the world, he went off to present. And uh, before he began, he spoke with the interpreter, he said, well, how are we going to do this? Let's just figure this out. And the interpreter says, leave it to me, no worries. Every 15 minutes, you pause, I'll interpret, and then you continue. That should work. He said, look, what I have to say is extremely dense. Uh, there are a lot of terms people are not familiar with. Do you think that's going to work? He says, yeah, I have confidence that will work. Well, after the first 15 minutes, he paused. The interpreter spoke a few words and motioned that he should continue. He was puzzled, baffled, uh, but the interpreter said to continue, and so he did. And this happened at even intervals every 15 minutes. And after his 60 minute presentation, after the fourth time that the interpreter did his work, there was a polite applause, a smattering, and it was over. When the presentation was over, the professor said to the interpreter, what you did was a marvel. If you don't mind, if you could just share with me how you were able to condense so much information in so few words. And the interpreter said, well, are you sure you really want to know? He says, yes, I'm, I'm intrigued. Please, share with me your technique. He said, OK, since you ask, I'll tell you. After the first 15 minutes, I said, I don't think we're going to hear anything new here tonight. <laughs> After the next 15 minutes, I said, nothing new to report. <laughs> After the third interval, I said, I don't think anything has changed. And when you concluded, I said, I was right at the beginning. <laughs> I begin with this because I hope that when you walk out of this room tonight, you will feel like you've heard nothing new. Not because I lack respect for you, and I have the chutzpah to bring you out on a summer evening to waste your time to hear nothing new, and not because I have no shred of self-respect, 
but rather because I hope that the concepts we speak about tonight will resonate so deeply, will ring so true, that each one of you will say, huh, nothing new. Of course, I knew this. We know this in the deepest part of ourselves. Having said that, let's begin. As I said, speaking about relationships is a precarious enterprise. And so I decided that the only way to really do this with any measure of honesty is to go for broke, is to take a cue from the very first relationship, the very first time there was something called a relationship. The very concept of a bond, of an alliance, of an affiliation, of a love affair is rooted in God's desire to create the world we inhabit. Our masters tell us that God Almighty needs nothing. But a tremendous desire arose within God for a relationship with you and me. And to this end, God created a world. So let's look at the paradigm for the first intimacy and glean some insights for our own life. Let's go back to a time before time, before space, before construction, before configuration, before alignment. Genesis gives us the story of creation. But what we want to talk about today is what preceded creation. And at that time, there is only one thing. The world is filled with, suffused with, what is termed in Kabbalistic terminology, the or in soul. The infinite, unlimited light of God. And in this situation, there is no possibility for anything to exist other than God. And so our Kabbalistic masters teach that the very first thing God did was something called Tzimtzum, constriction, pulling in as it were, contraction. So God pulled his, her light out of the center as it were creating a spherical vacuum in which something other than the Godhead can exist. And this, of course, is rule number one in creating, in forging, in nourishing, in nurturing successful relationships. Seems so. It's really simple. Pull yourself out of the center. It's so easy to talk about and so very difficult to do. Well, like somebody so eloquent once said, it's not about you, dummy. <laughs> Did you ever hear people say, oh, we have a great relationship if it weren't for you? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have a relationship if it's not for me and you. Now, according to our sages, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, but you really shouldn't use the name Eve. Eve is etymologically rooted in the Latin E-O-F, which means evil. Means evil. evil. Chava means mother of all life. Just a tiny indication of how different our theology is from others, and unfortunately, how often they are sort of soldered together out of ignorance. Names, etymology, teach us a great deal. In any case, Adam and Chava were created as one. They were a dimorphous figure. Their separation, their becoming two, their amputation from each other brought new challenges to the fore. How do two become one? And that, of course, can only be overcome by their abandoning their sense of self which is possible only by focusing on what binds them. 
And in one word, it's the soul, the oneness, the common source that fuses them. But they have to abandon egocentricity, which is why it should come as no surprise to us that the creation story concerning the first man, the first organism, is interrupted by God's command not to eat from the tree of da'at, of good and evil. Everybody familiar with that tree? Now most often that tree is defined as the tree of, there was a tree of life, but that was the other one. The Eitzadah, the tree of Dot, is often defined as knowledge. But the truth is that the most authentic understanding of the word Dot is not knowledge, but consciousness. And God says to them, if you want to have any success at forging a lasting relationship, you cannot eat from the tree of self-consciousness. That is the root of all pathologies regarding relationships, interpersonal relationships, and the vertical relationship between man and God. You've got to get off the self, says God. That's the only thing that's going to bring you to step one. The only thing defined as no good in Genesis is when Adam is alone. It's no good for man to be alone. This sense of me, this obfuscation of the other, and a larger dynamic of why I'm here, that's noxious. That's poison. So by warning Adam not to eat from this tree, this source of, and this consuming source of self-awareness, <coughs> self-centeredness, that causes good and bad to form an amalgam, God is giving us the single most important piece of advice in our relationships. Don't eat from that tree. Grow up. Babies are born selfish. It's not their fault. It's not our fault. That is the default. I, me, my agenda, I want, I need, I feel. It's interesting because in so many theologies, in so many ways of thinking, there's a quest for finding oneself. And Judaism asks us to do only one thing. Lose yourself. Lose your sense of self so you could enter into something larger. So the marriage thus becomes centrifugal. It's fueled by something larger than the self. It's centered beyond the principal parties. Create a space in which something higher than yourself can occur just like God did. But at this point, I know I've been introduced as Rabbi Robertson Levertaus Machatenista, a word unique to the Jewish language, which means the in-laws. Jackie Mason does a wonderful routine on that, if you're interested. Sociologists say you can learn most about a society by studying the words that are unique to that society that can't be found in any other language. Machatenim is one of those words, but I digress. So I know that you feel you need to be polite to me, being that I have such connections here. <laughs> but the truth is that there has to be a limit even to politeness. And I said something heretical, and at this point you should be throwing tomatoes at me, or at least the bottle of water you've been providing. I'll repeat the heresy. <laughs> I talked about God pulling him herself out of the center to make a space, what is called in Kabbalistic terminology, halal panui, in which this world could exist. Now, what's problematic with that statement? Yes? Perhaps it implies that God is not in the world? That's exactly the problem. There is no space. There can be no space bereft of God. That is axiomatic in Jewish thought. The world is not an expression of its creator. The world in its entirety exists within its creator. 
So what kind of gibberish am I talking here? Has, has the desert heat gotten to my head? An empty space? And so in fact we're taught that it is only empty insofar as our perception. That the immense light and the searing heat of God exists, of course, in this world, but on a level that transcends our apprehension. Similar to, okay, say, the, the noises that dogs can pick up, but we can't, okay, because we don't pick up those decibels. There are things that exist, but we simply don't have the ability to perceive, to take in. So God's light, of course, is here, but it's shrouded, it's obscured. What's the Hebrew word for the word world? Hebrew word? Olam. The word olam is rooted in the Hebrew helem, which means shrouded, obscured. The world is nothing more than a mask, a shroud for its creator. It skillfully masks its vivifying force. And so what we really have is two types of godly light. The unfettered, uncontrolled, blinding, infinite, unending light of God, which continues to operate outside of the confines of what we call Olam. And then we have a very different type of light within the world. A light that is not readily perceived by us humans. A light that is shrouded. A light that is obscured. And here we come to secret number two in forging and maintaining our relationships. Recognize and appreciate the inherent duality in any relationship. I know it's against the Ten Commandments, but I do covet. I covet John Gray and the millions he made based on this simple principle. Men and women are different. Earth to Mars and Venus. And no amount of uh, massaging the facts will change this. So secret number two is, yes, there are two different types of light. Yes, this duality, this apparent fracture, is meant to bring us to a higher level of union. But you'd have to be an idiot to ignore the very real differences between the two and appreciate them. So let's go back to this word dot which we've now defined as consciousness. And we said, it's not a good thing to eat from the tree of consciousness. But yet, when Adam and Chava become one, what is the word used in the Bible for the intimacy that they enjoy? Adam, from the same edema. What are we supposed to make of this? It's very simple. Self-consciousness, self-absorption is noxious. Other consciousness, the consciousness and the sensitivity of the other, this is what intimacy is all about. That's why the Bible uses that word. Not because it's prudish, not because it's looking for euphemisms. On the contrary. Because it's looking to give us what is the only definition of human intimacy. Which is the concentrated consciousness of the other. And mysticism teaches us something interesting. That a prelude to consciousness is recognition. If you want to enter an intimacy with someone, you need to be able to recognize them. Now what does this mean? The Talmud teaches 
that when Adam and Chava were in dimorphous form, they existed back to back. They were one being, but they could not see each other. And so really they were operating in alternate universes. Do you know people who are operating in back-to-back -back relationships? If you don't, good for you. That's wonderful. But it's very possible to do that, unfortunately. It was only possible for them to actually become one when they were separated from each other and they were, for the first time, able to see each other, to face each other, to recognize each other, to see each other as separate entities, and only then could they join. The English word respect actually emerges from the Latin respice, which means to gaze, to see, to discern. If we look in the Tanakh, if we look into the Jewish canon, Strangely enough, we find that the word for recognition, which we said is a prelude to intimacy, comes from the root lahakir. But from the very same edaman, we get one of the biblical words for stranger. And what word is that? Anybody? Ger is one word for stranger. Not related to the Edaman of Hakara. Zar. Zar, also not related. Nahri, exactly. Now, this is bizarre. Because a stranger is defined as someone you do not recognize. <coughs> so, is it one or is it the other? Judaism has a way of coming up with surprising answers. It's both. And this is a radical and a helpful teaching. True recognition, true knowledge, is predicated on a certain measure of strangeness and distance. It depends on the attracts. The unknown beckons and is extremely enticing. It asks to be revealed. This is actually what romance thrives on. Knowing the unknowable. So paradoxically, God divides Adam and Chava so that they can look at each other and become one. But that depends, of course, on their becoming two, on this delicate balance of looking, respecting, but never knowing all, not subsuming, being the known but the unknowable at the same time. Like God, appearing to Moses in the burning bush, or God after Sinai, telling Moses, you can see my back, but not my face. Many commentators teach that this is what Rebecca was telling Isaac when she first saw him. You might remember that before she saw her and her husband for the first time, she veiled herself. <clears throat> With this, she was signaling to her husband, we will be married. We will forge a path together. We will make changes that will have a ripple effect until the end of time. And we are partners in life. But there will always be aspects that you will not know about me. We are one, and yet we remain unknowable. The recognition that includes an element of strangeness ultimately leads to this knowledge, this intimacy that we all so desperately want in our lives. So now we have two of the secrets. We have God pulling God of the center, and we have God creating a dynamic where there's two diametrically opposing lights, each one needing to be appreciated and understood and embraced for what it brings to the table. In the Psalms, King David uses a beautiful allegory concerning God, and uses the words, Ki shemesh Hashem Elohim. God is the sun and the shield of the sun. What exactly does that mean? Well, we all know, you may, you may feel this a little more in, 
Arizona than I feel this in Binghamton, New York, where the average weather uh, throughout the year is, uh, I would say, a warm 52. Um, that's averaging all the seasons. I think, I think that would probably be correct. Uh, but we know that the sun must remain at a critically and precise distance from planet Earth. Why? What happens if it comes any closer? The world will be destroyed. It becomes subsumed to the heat. However, what happens if the sun were to be at a greater distance than it is currently from the Earth? Freeze. It's over. And this is exactly the relationship between God and the universe he created. God can't get too close to us. God can't be text messaging me and reminding me, remember the Ten Commandments, remember the 630 Commandments, remember, remember, remember. You've got to give me my space. I can't serve God of my own volition if you're crowding my space. So God has to pull out of the center. But God can't go too far. Because I can't live without a relationship with God. And so here the Kabbalah teaches us about the third secret in relationship. The Kabbalah describes God streaming into this spherical vacuum we've now described as our world, Olam, an intense vector, a ray, of the or ain't self, of the unlimited light that revolves around the space we have defined as Olam, as the world. And this thin vector of light rotates within the world in a series of ten rotations, giving us the exquisite, balanced amount of light that will not overwhelm us, but will sustain and nourish us. Secret number three in our relationships? Give. It's that simple. You've got to give. The word for love in Hebrew is ahaba. But the edemon of the word ahaba is actually of Aramaic extraction, ahib, which means to give. And we're not just talking about giving presence. We're talking about giving presence, being there. And being there in the way that is not overwhelming, in a way that is helpful and nourishing and replenishing without subsuming the other. This is not an easy task. None of this is easy. It's easy to talk about. It's not easy to do. And our tradition teaches that God recreates the world on a constant basis. Every moment, God recreates the world entire. And so it is that each one of us has to constantly, repeatedly, and in an uninterrupted fashion, in pulsing motion, continue to recreate our relationships by giving to the others. You often hear people talk about how their fear began. They make it sound like it was a, I don't know, a motor vehicle accident. It just happened, mistake. Or like they skidded on a patch of black ice. They, I assume you don't get a lot of that. <laughs> uh, it just happened. It doesn't just happen. There's a psychologist whose work really resonates with me, Shirley P. Glass. And she has this very interesting Theory. She actually made a living studying infidelity, so she's probably set for life. Um, she has this theory, which she calls the wall and window theory. And she explains, it's very simple. She explains that every relationship, like a house, needs both walls and windows. And all the problems begin when people replace walls with windows and windows with walls. Now how does that happen? Very simple. You're sitting in the office, you're talking with a coworker, and in, for some odd reason, you blurt out something really personal, 
That's knowledge that doesn't belong to anybody but you and your spouse. You have just created a window where a weight-bearing wall belongs. Now, here's the problem. When you go home at night and you talk to your spouse, that's where there's supposed to be these beautiful picture windows bringing light and ear into your relationship. Well, you're carrying this sordid secret of what happened earlier that day. So instead of a window, you put up a wall. And this happens enough time. And the space you're supposed to be sharing with your spouse becomes a dark, dank, arid space where you can no longer breathe. So then, when by mistake, your lips touch each other at work, it's magic. You're in love. Ridiculous love. The most I'll give that is infatuation. That's, if you don't know the genealogy, love's slimy second cousin. The one who can't hold down a regular job, always borrows your car, and always brings it home with an empty tank. Okay? You know that one? Stay away. Give. That's what God taught us in the very first relationship. Got to give on a constant basis. Make sure the walls are where the walls belong. Make sure the windows are where the windows belong. And make sure we're giving in a way that is respectful of our differences. I have a colleague. I'm not going to give you too much information because the world is very small. But um, she and her husband run a Chabad center somewhere in the United States. And when they moved into their new home, uh, somebody in the community uh, called them and said, I have a great present for you. And uh, my good friend and, and colleague uh, was very appreciative. She said, thank you very much. And she assumed that, you know, the present would either come in the mail, which was probably the best present, uh, or, you know, they would drop it off, a housewarming present. Well, a few hours pass, and this huge truck pulls up and delivers trees. Now, like myself, she grew up in Brooklyn. A tree grows in Brooklyn, you might remember. <laughs> we don't really know what to do with trees. Okay? But aside from that, when you have 11 kids, you just moved into a new home, you have a lot of things to do, and landscaping is not the first thing on your head, and you don't have disposable income, you really don't know what to do with the trees. Well, a few hours passes, and she gets another call. Do you love my present? What do you ask for that kind of question? Uh, if you don't have the right person, I can give you my guy. Well, at this point, she has no choice. Those trees have to get planted. You cannot imagine what it costs to plant those trees. You cannot imagine the maintenance of these specific trees. You cannot imagine the amount of phone calls she got about the trees. You cannot imagine how these trees have become the bane of her existence, a so-called present. The kind we need to make sure we don't give the people we want to remain in relationships with. So sometimes it's easy to give the kind of present you would want. What we really need to do is think about what does the other person want. And finally, it's very simple. After God pulls him herself out of the center, and there are two types of light which must be appreciated. And God gives. God now says to us, it's your turn. I am now ready to receive. And that is secret number four for successful relationships. We need to be able to receive from the other. to give the other a chance to enrich our lives. Because if I am so perfect, and I am so bereft of need, 
That renders you completely and utterly superfluous. Not a very good feeling and not a very good start for a relationship. Which really brings us back to secret number one, pulling yourself out of the center. You can only receive from someone else if you're not completely filled up with your sense of self. Somebody who knows everything, has everything, is everything, cannot possibly accept anything from someone else. Now, in summation, everything I've said thus far is helpful and effective and is proven in any relationship, filial, business, social, it'll work every single time. Pull yourself out of the center, respect differences, give and receive. So I'd like to conclude with saying a few words specifically about the relationship between husband and wife. King Solomon begins what is arguably the world's greatest book on love and romance, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, with the words, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. God bless you. I don't know how to say it in Spanish. It's not the only book King Solomon wrote. But it's the one book in which he puts his name, the author's name, in the first sentence. And with this, King Solomon teaches us an important lesson. I'm giving you a book about a man and woman. I'm giving you a book about plurality. I'm giving you a book about duality. I'm giving you a book about a relationship that can take you to the greatest heights and can be the cause of the greatest pain and friction. So you need to know from the get-go this is really not a book about two. This is really a book about one. That needs to be your point of departure. Shlomo is etymologically rooted in the word shalem, complete, whole, oneness. In very simple, practical terms, King Solomon is teaching us that if our relationships are to endure, we need to be more in love with the concept of the relationship than with each other. And before you use your water now in earnest, in protest of such a strange idea, let me explain. I am not saying that chemistry is not important. I am not saying that it's not important to feel infatuated. What I am saying is, what anybody with two eyes and a mind can discern for themselves. We live in an age where people are not forced to marry each other. They're in love. So what I'm trying to figure out is, where does all that love go? Three years, five years, seven years, 13 years, 22 years down the line. Where is it being weirdest? To where has it dissipated? Might it not be true that commitment will lead to love? But love doesn't always lead to commitment. And so King Solomon is saying, remember your point of departure, remember your point of return. The notion of you and me as separate beings is all wrong. There's no hope for a relationship when a husband and wife see each other as a luxury, sort of an appendix. It has to be that they feel a lack of completion without the other that cannot be remedied by a job promotion, more letters <coughs> after one's name, an amassment of assets. There is nothing, nothing that can take the place of the other. The first Adam creature, as we've already discussed, was created androgynous, dimorphous, as one. And that puts into our psyche and our mechanism a need for
for the other. The possibility, in fact, and the need, the incessant need, to be reunited. And that's the real reason we marry. People ask, why marry? I submit that that's an excellent question with not a good answer, especially today. I don't know. Why should anybody get married? You don't need to get married for social acceptance or recognition. You don't need to get married for economic reasons. One might argue the opposite is true. You don't need to get married to have children. You don't need to get married for job promotion. So why, why get married? I submit the question is wrong. The real question is, how can I not get married? It's like the proverbial piece of that puzzle that runs around saying, trying to find myself. Well, if you put yourself next to the other pieces of the puzzle in which you belong, you will find the essential self you're looking for. This is actually the radical contribution of the Jewish philosophy to relationships. To marriage specifically, I correct myself. It's not a question of why, it's a question of how could you not. So if the basic attitude is, well, if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, nothing gained and nothing lost, then uh, <laughs> that's a basic attitude. But if the basic attitude is, you are me and I am you, that's a whole different thing. And it's going to manifest itself in all of our interactions. What do you do when you get annoyed with yourself? Tell me the truth. What do you do when you get annoyed with yourself? You cry? <laughs> tell, me, tell me what you do. <laughs> you try to distract yourself? It's so painful to be annoyed with yourself. You might, you might say to yourself, oh, such an idiot. I can't believe I did this. I, make, I have to make a note to myself that I do this again. But most people, when they get annoyed with themselves, don't start thinking about the best divorce lawyer in town. <laughs> what are you, you going to do? You hate your nose. So are you going to amputate your nose? The most you might do is get a nose job. In other words, if you are really one, then you see that person's faults like you see your own faults which is uh, an annoyance some of the time, something you have to deal with, something you have to work with, and most of the time we don't see it at all. The Zohar says something spectacular, that a husband and wife are not just two halves of one soul, which I'm guessing many of you have heard already, it's a basic Jewish teaching, but the husband and wife are actually two parts of one body. This takes a while. It takes years to actually feel. But to feel that is to, is to come into something spectacularly sweet and delicious. Now this commitment to the other is not about writing sonnets and reading poetry. That's nice too. But it's about the stuff that life is made of. Taking out the garbage, picking up the socks. It's precisely in the day-to-day -day minutia that we express our love for the other. It's precisely the things we don't feel like doing. The Kabbalah says that when lovers see each other after a very, very long time, the tendency is towards an embrace, a hug. The differentiated kissing, the hugging, the lovemaking will come later. But first, a tight embrace. And the Kabbalah says the message here is, I love you. I love every part of you, even the plainest, simplest part of you, your back. It doesn't have to be beautiful lips. It doesn't have to be beautiful eyes. It doesn't have to be curves or contours. Just you and nothing else. I'd like to wish you and me the most important blessing of all. It is said that we were created in God's image. There are many ways of understanding this. But the understanding that resonates most deeply with me is the following. God creates the world on a constant basis in uninterrupted fashion. 
And to be created in God's image is to be given the opportunity to make choices in life that we would like to make, that we consciously embrace again and again and again in uninterrupted fashion. And so I wish all of us that we be able to tap into relationships and nourish relationships that we would choose again and again and again, every day, every moment. So you want to know if marriages are made in heaven, why it's so difficult to find your partner on earth. <laughs> that, that's the age-old question. And the truth is that this question is part of the existential question of the trajectory we call life. Because it really goes back to the very beginning of time, where Adam and Chava eat from the tree of consciousness of good and evil. And they bring into this world a whole new reality with new ramifications. The truth is that the whole story with the tree of knowledge or the tree of consciousness of good and evil is extremely curious and difficult to understand. The Midrash says that the best analogy for this is a man who comes home and he says to his wife, make me a cup of tea. And she makes him a cup of tea. And he takes one sip and he says, it's cold, that's it, you're divorced. And she says to him, you're crazy. You had that bill of divorce in your pocket when you came home. This is just a pretext. <laughs> and the Midrash says the same as with the tree of knowledge to the evil. If God didn't really want Adam and Chava to eat from it, why did God create it? Why did God put it in the center of the, of, the, of the garden? Why did God tell them about it? He said. And this is what Chava knew. Chava knew that ultimately, God wanted a world which was different than the garden of Eden which was completely suffused and pervaded with God consciousness. In fact, God wanted man to find God of his or her own volition, to work on the relationship. And so Adam and Chava are banished from the Garden of Eden. And they and their descendants, including ourselves, spend the next few millennia recreating the Garden of Eden on our own space. And the same thing happens with the creation of Adam and Chava. God creates them as one. So just leave them as one. Everything will be wonderful, right? No. Then God separates them. Then God says you should become one flesh. Make up your mind. You see, this is proof positive that God is a woman. <laughs> tell me, what do you want? You want one, you want two, you want one. Just tell me whatever you want, I'll say yes, honey. But God says, I want you to work at it. Because only by working to find it, only through the struggle, only through forging the path with your own sweat and your own breath, will you eat your breath. And yes, it is true that we believe in the concept of a share that it is destined. But we don't, we're not born holding the hand of our destiny. It's, it's, a, pro, it's, a, it's a work, it's a journey, it's sometimes much more difficult than other times. It's, it's something we have to work at and pray for. Yes. So then, if you marry someone who's not in your church, then should you work on that relationship? Ah, uh, the $60 million dollar question. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'll just wait for that right now. I, 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 like, I, like I began, I will end with saying the same thing I said at the beginning. Speaking on this topic is presumptuous at best, and asinine is worse. So I said I don't want to fall into the latter category. I'll say this. 
my, it is my understanding that most generally speaking, when two people get married, that marriage was bashed. Now, even if that marriage lasts for a very short amount of time, for some reason, those two half souls had to come together. Now, whether they should continue to stay together or not depends on a host of factors which we cannot oversimplify. So clearly, in a situation where there is some type of abuse, where there is some type of pathology that cannot in any way be overcome with any type of remediation or therapy, the obvious answer there is that the union has to be dissolved. It's not Catholicism, it's Judaism. We believe in divorce when it's necessary. On the other hand, the Talmud teaches that when two souls are torn from each other, the very altar of God cries out. So it's the last option. It's a painful option. Like I said, if, if I don't like the fact that one of my arms is getting fat, what am I going to do? Amputate it? If it's me, I'm going to work with it. I'm going to do everything I can. You know, they say that the only thing that you could use to make a diamond more smooth or to cut a diamond back is another diamond. No one ever promised us a rose garden. No one, no one ever said that when two halves of soul that are destined to spend their lives together, that are soldered together, that everything's going to be smooth. That it's going to feel like a cotton glove on the diamond. Sometimes two diamonds need to rub against each other until they find a the smoothness. Sometimes that is the path, that is the trajectory. So there's no one answer that fits all. Every situation needs to be looked at separately. But, but in general, our, our point of departure is, yes, we are making a commitment. We hope for this to work. This is me. This is not an accessory. This is me. Yes? Could that mean, then, that a person could have more than one of the shirt in their lifetime? Yeah, absolutely. So you don't believe, then, that the determination of one's best shirt takes place at the, end of, at the end of one's life where you look back and say, ah, so-and-so was really my destiny. Instead, you believe there could be multiple destinies with that life. Well, first of all, I want to qualify. There are two ways of understanding what you just said about multiple bashers. One is, simply speaking, that a person might be married to more than one person in a lifetime. A person might be married and get divorced. A person might, God forbid, lose their spouse and remarry. That's one understanding of multiple bashers. There is a much more complex understanding of multiple bashers, and that is the notion that, in fact, there could be multiple people with whom we can be fused. And the reason is this. The Talmud teaches, Hakol bidei shamayim chutz miyirat shamayim. Everything in the hands of heaven, aside from fear of heaven. In plain English, this means we have no real choices in life except for the choices we make within the moral arena. Now, because we might make certain choices in life which will lead us to a certain place spiritually, in that place we might meet one Bashert. Had we not made those choices, we would meet a completely different Bashert. That's another way of understanding the concept of multiple bashers. You spoke about uh, uh, double sides of a union and based on the Kabbalistic teachings, how each of them has to give, how each of them has to uh, key and all the other things. Is there any differences that you want to bring up to what is the uniqueness of each one of you? That's a presentation for a different night. Uh, so for tonight, I think what I wanted to bring out is that we need to, to be very, very careful about appreciating those differences, not blurring those differences, and not embarking on a route where we think that we can um, just wave those differences away. Uh, but the very real differences between men and women is, is a presentation on its own. <laughs>